Avishik ji, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Please put on the live. Please put on the live. I'm about to start. All right. All right. So good evening, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we are starting with the first lecture of our Oka Saga series. Uh, on behalf of Red Lantern Analytica, which we all know is an international affairs observer group based out of New Delhi, India. Uh, we ba basically focus on critical issues related to China with a special focus on Sino-India relations, issues of national security, international security, energy, environment, and uh, weapons of mass destruction. The main aim of our organization is to draw in India's foremost academic institutions and security intelligentsia, corporate institutions, monetary establishments, and experts in, experts in discussion on India's foreign policy and extend the country's role in global issues. To maximize the institutional and scholarly capacity of strategic thinking in India, we are uh, uh, trying to integrate expertise in our research in order to foster an even-minded international strategy for India. So with this goal in mind, uh, we are about to start uh, a new series on the Orca Saga and uh, our today's uh, presentation uh, would be a very special one as we have a very eminent guest with us whom uh, Ms. Ifra Ali would introduce. Over to you, Ifra. Thank you, Sushiji. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you all are keeping well. And a warm welcome to every one of you to our very first webinar series named AUKUS Saga. Seemingly, the AUKUS strategic relationship between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States has caused a commotion that can be heard from Indo-Pacific to the Atlantic. Canberra is relieved, Beijing is outraged, Paris is irritated, and Southeast Asia is terrified as Washington plans to held up its tightly guarded nuclear submarine technology. In New Delhi, the reactions has been a blend of good and bad. The only direct remark on AUKUS came from Foreign Secretary Harsh Shringla, who suggested that the deal was a strategic alliance among the three Anglo-Saxon powers and therefore irrelevant since it would have no impact on the functioning of the Quad. However, there have been some Indian scholars who are somewhat, somewhat skeptical about the AUKUS, cautioning that it would damage the Quad as it gained momentum and would also, if Australia and the US could deceive, deceive France, a North Atlantic Treaty Organization partner, they ask, what is to prevent them from doing, so with the, from doing the same with the lesser allies? Again, there's also skepticism regarding the fact that despite the momentous growth in the Indo-US strategic partnership, Washington won't share its top shelf defense technologies with the New Delhi, even when India needs are the most pressing, given the fact that China pose, given the threat that China poses on its Himalayan borders. On the other hand, these concerns also underestimate the potential benefits of AUKUS for India's nuclear submarine programs. The global, uh, the global market for sensitive military technology and the evolving balance of the naval power in the Indo-Pacific. To enlighten us more on this issue, we have with us today a very eminent nuclear expert, Dr. Manfri Sethi, distinguished fellow, Center for Asian Power Studies, Air Power Studies, New Delhi, who has been leading the project on nuclear security at the center for at least 18 years. She is an expert on the entire spectrum of nuclear issues, ranging from nuclear energy, strategy, non-proliferation, disarmament, arms control, and ballistic missile defense. She has authored, edited, and co-authored eight books and three monographs. She also has published about 100 papers in books academic journals of repute. Her book, Nuclear Strategy, India's March Towards Credible Deterrence 2009, is deemed essential reading at many colleges and armed forces institutions. Dr. Dr. Sethi received her PhD from the Center of Latin American and Western West European Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New, New Delhi in 1997. 
Soon thereafter, she started her career as an analyst specializing in nuclear issues at the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, IDSA, New Delhi, which was the only national security think tank at, think tank at that time. She also worked there until 2002 and therefore joined CAPS. As a founding member, she helped craft the nuclear research program at the center which is today at the forefront of national nuclear studies and analysis. Dr. Sethi lectures regularly at the Defense Capital and the National Defense College and other leading establishments of Indian Air Force, police and foreign services, and also at various colleges and universities. She has mentored several young scholars and officers through her nuclear strategy group at CAPS and as an external examiner for MPhil and PhD students at JNU, Delhi University and Madras University. She has been conducting a biannual nuclear strategy capsule for a senior officer of the armed forces, military of external affairs, department of atomic energy, defense and research and development organization and national security council secretariat for last 14 years. Over 1400 officers have been benefited from the exercise. Dr. Sethi has been a regular participant in flagship nuclear policy conferences of US, Russia, European Union, China, and India. She has also contributed to the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, a hyper hypersonic missile and nuclear risk reduction. She was also a member of Prime Minister's informal group on disarmament in 2012, a member executive board of the Indian Pugwar Society for a period of three years. She has also been a part of several Track 2 initiatives. She is currently on board of directors on the Asia Pacific Leadership Network and Women Nuclear India. She is a recipient of the prestigious K. Subramaniam Award in 2014, an honor conferred on a scholar for consistency and excellence in strategic and security issues. In a rare honor of for a civilian, on the occasion of the Air Force Day, in, uh, on 8th of October 2020, she was commended by the Chief of the Air Staff for her dedication and professional ability. We welcome you, ma'am. We were eagerly waiting to hear you for a very long time, and the day has finally arrived. The stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Ifra, and thank you for uh, you know going through that biodata so diligently, which really was uh, more than I thought was necessary. Um, and also thank you, Sreyoshi, uh, for introducing me to this new platform, uh, which I believe uh, uh, founded by Mr. Abhishek Ranjan is evolving uh, very quickly into uh, a major contributor to building India's intellectual capacity. I think matters of national security concern us all. And what we need are not just opinions which are superficial, but considered opinions that arise after some uh, churning of thought of some discussion and debate of the kind uh, that uh, we are going to engage in today. Now, I took, uh, you know, while this is called the AUKUS Saga series, and we will be talking about AUKUS, but I took uh, Sreyoshi's permission to broad base my subject a little bit uh, in, in order to understand what is the contemporary nuclear non-proliferation landscape. You know, for a long period of time, at least for the last 10 uh, years or so, there was a general belief globally, worldwide, uh, that nuclear non-proliferation is an accepted fact, that uh, nuclear weapons will slowly fade out uh, from national security strategies, that the norm of non-use of nuclear weapons is strong, so weapons are not going to come into play, uh, and therefore more proliferation will not happen. Now, just 10 years from that thought process, we seem to have arrived at a situation where uh, the landscape is not looking like that at all. The norms of both non-proliferation as well as the norm of non-use of nuclear weapons both seem to be under severe threat. But caught as we are, uh, especially in our region, with concerns of geopolitics and geoeconomics that are arising with the rising uh, of of a state in the neighborhood, uh, which seems to be treading on toes of many, many countries, including that of India. Um, the focus on non-proliferation seems to have 
participated a little. And what I wanted to do with my you know, lecture today uh, was essentially to place AUKUS within this contemporary uh, non-proliferation landscape. So we will talk about AUKUS, but more than that, I want to just give you the lay of the land on the non-proliferation issues and how uh, some of the new developments that are happening, like the AUKUS, are going to implicate on non-proliferation. So let me start by showing you this clock face. Sreyoshi is very familiar with this because at CAPS, I have shown it millions of times because it gives you a very graphic, quick representation of what is the state of play on uh, nuclear non-proliferation, on the nuclear dangers that the world is facing. So the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, uh, which is from Washington, D.C., uh, an, an organization that brings out a journal uh, every month, in January of every year, they revise the time on this clock. So the closer you are to midnight, the greater it means you are to nuclear Armageddon, that the dangers from the nuclear weapons dimension, the possibility of use of the nuclear weapon is that much more. And as you can see, today we are at 100 seconds to midnight. This time was revised in January this year. Uh, and this is the closest that we have ever been to midnight, which means the end of the world. Uh, and there are two parameters that the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists takes for arriving at this conclusion on the time. One is the nuclear dangers, and the other is the climatic dangers. From climate change, uh, what are the uh, impacts that, that are being felt across the world that could be pushing you towards more and more disasters? And on both the fronts, as you can see, and I'm going to show you the nuclear dimension, uh, we are very close to midnight. So this is one way of quickly absorbing uh, the kind of uh, nuclear landscape that we are in. Based on this now, the scope of my talk is essentially going to look at these few issues. I'm looking at the contemporary challenges to nuclear non-proliferation. And I find them in both the di dimensions, vertical as well as horizontal. Vertical non-proliferation means increase in nuclear numbers and modernization of the arsenals. And we see this happening in all the nuclear armed states today. As a result of which, we are seeing a growing salience of nuclear weapons. The importance of nuclear weapons in national security strategies has actually increased uh, in the last few years. And nobody seems to be in a mood for disarmament, certainly not the nuclear armed states who really matter or when we talk about disarmament issues. On the horizontal front, on uh, more countries being able to acquire nuclear weapons, there are two persistent issues which have continued. One is North Korea and the other is Iran. And we'll very briefly talk about them because there isn't much time to go into details, but I hope to be able to at least provoke you into thinking about these issues. Then we'll talk about AUKUS and its impact on non-proliferation. What does it mean for the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty? And of course, in, in the case of each, I want to highlight the implications for India. What does it mean when modernization is happening, when disarmament is out of the window, when North Korea is continuing to build up its capability, Iran, AUKUS, what does all of this mean for India? So it's from the Indian perspective that I'm you know, mapping out these challenges before you. Let me start with the nuclear weapons modernization trends. And as I mentioned to you, each of the nuclear armed states today, and there are nine of them, as you know, five which are recognized by the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And there are four, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea, uh, which have nuclear weapons, but which are outside the NPT. And all nine of them, are building their nuclear capabilities. All of them uh, face heightened threat perceptions from each other. Each is assuming the worst of the other. There are no strategic dialogues that are happening between them. The US and Russia have very recently started a strategic stability dialogue uh, in uh, you know middle of this year after the summit that happened between Presidents Biden and Putin. But, uh, it will be a long haul before this stability dialogue actually is able to bring stability into the relationship. So there are heightened threat perceptions, as a result of which all countries are following hedging strategies. Each one is building capability in order to hedge against what is an assumed uh, capability buildup on the other side. 
So worst case assumptions are being taken about what the other side is doing and you are building your hedging strategies around them, which brings you then into an offense defense spiral. So one country is building up a capability. The other is building another capability to defend against the offensive capability. And then the first country is having to build more capability to counter the defense that has been created. A good example of this is the ballistic missile defense that the US started uh, you know, uh, developing and deploying. And now Russia and China are building cruise missiles, hypersonic missiles, MIRV missiles, where one missile can carry multiple warheads in order to defeat the missile defense. And in um, response to these developments of Russia and China, you find the US now building counter hypersonic defenses, uh, thinking about placing interceptors in space to be able to counter the hypersonic missiles. So we see uh, an offense defense spiral uh, very visibly in the relationship. And amidst all this, there is no interest in nuclear disarmament amongst the nuclear armed states. It is ironical, in fact, to make that statement because the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is popularly known as the Ban Treaty, which is the only legally binding instrument that prohibits the development, testing, production, everything related to nuclear weapons, including the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons. This treaty has come into play. It has entered into force this year. Uh, and surprisingly, even so, we find disarmament is not on the horizon. So the treaty exists, banning nuclear weapons in every form, their possession, their testing, their stockpiling, transfer, everything. And yet disarmament is not uh, in the picture. This treaty was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 2017 with, you can see here, 122 votes in favor, which is not a small number of states, but all of them were non-nuclear armed states, not nuclear armed states that accepted this treaty. So even when the treaty was opened for signature in September 2017, 50 countries signed on the same day, but they were all non-nuclear countries. Uh, the current signatories are about 80, out of which we have about 56 which have ratified the treaty. So after 50 countries had ratified, it's only then that the treaty can enter into force. And as I'm mentioning to you, uh, 50 countries did sign, uh, ratify by uh, this year. And in uh, on 22 January 2021, the treaty then entered into force. But it has no support from the nine nuclear armed states. In fact, US, UK, France have made rather harsh statements against the ban treaty to say we are never going to join the treaty. And each of the other countries also has articulated its own position on why they find this treaty not the right approach to get to disarmament. Now, implications of all of this for India, the fact that nuclear weapons modernization is happening and disarmament is not in the picture, it means that nuclear weapons are here to stay. And this matters for a country like India because we have seen nuclear weapons as necessary evil. We need them because of the security environment around us. But if all the countries could move towards elimination of nuclear weapons through a multilaterally negotiated, consensus-based, verifiable, uh, you know, trust-based treaty, uh, then India is happy to give up its nuclear weapons. Uh, but because of the trends that I have pointed out to you, we know that nuclear weapons are not going away in a hurry. We see rather a surrounding nuclear cacophony where countries are uh, inclined towards building more and more rather than talking about giving up uh, the weapons capability. We are also in a situation of nuclear chain relations where the relationship between countries is no longer bipolar or straightforward as it used to be during the Cold War between US and USSR. Today, anything uh, that we are talking about, for instance, in the South Asian region between India and Pakistan cannot but take into account what China is doing. Uh, and China will have to look at what the US, uh, Russia, other countries are doing. And therefore, everything spirals into a chain uh, conundrum. Uh, at the nuclear level. So you're not going to be able to find regional solutions alone uh, for the kind of global chains uh, that have evolved in the nuclear dimension. These are also times of strident nationalism where each country is thinking about its national interests before international peace and security concepts. 
So in this age of hyper nationalism, when you know, leaders are focused on, on uh, you know, a realist worldview, uh, thinking only about their own countries, uh, it seems to be the reality that we have to face. In all of this, India faces the risk of being sucked into an arms race. Some of you might know that we crafted a nuclear doctrine for ourselves in 1999. This doctrine made it very clear that we are going to build a small arsenal, what we call credible minimum deterrence, and that we will exercise deterrence by the idea of punishment. So because the weapon is of a nature that can cause large scale damage, we will build small numbers, but we will call, cause maximum damage, massive retaliation to the other side if they use their nuclear weapons against us. That's the concept of India's deterrence. But because of the circumstances that are developing around us, the chances of our being sucked into an arms race have increased. And that really is my worry of one of the implications for India. Because the more we go on developing capability, we will also have to face the risk of creating more security dilemmas. So when India started talking about ballistic missile defense, Pakistan went ahead and tested cruise missiles, uh, which a ballistic missile defense cannot intercept. Uh, now, these cruise missiles have become an additional problem for India. So one can take action that can create more security dilemmas uh, if the changes in our force structure are not adequately thought out. And these are some of the implications that I find from the modernization trends that India will have to look out for. On non-proliferation now, uh, I'll talk about a little bit about North Korea and Iran. So North Korea and the developments there uh, are recent history. We are all aware of the kind of war of words we saw with President uh, you know, Trump uh, and Kim Jong-un uh, in 2017-18. That is when the hysteria about war really became uh, you know, at its peak. But fortunately, uh, nothing major uh, happened. And uh, we did have some good summit diplomacy when President Trump invited Kim Jong-un to come and have uh, a conversation, engagement with him on nuclear issues, first in Singapore and then in Hanoi. Uh, but unfortunately, nothing much came out of these two summits. Uh, from the first summit, we did get a joint statement from the two talking about what steps could be taken towards denuclearization. Uh, but after Hanoi, where both sides just walked away from the meeting, nothing concrete really came out. Since then, we have seen more missile tests being done by DPRK. In fact, in the last three or four months, there has been a spate of missile tests uh, bringing out new technology, new capability buildup that North Korea has been moving towards, mobility of missiles on rail-based platforms, uh, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, even hypersonic missiles that they've claimed, so these are some of the missile tests that DPRK has been up to. The problem here is that South Korea, Japan, and US, which are the most affected by North Korea's nuclear program, are not on the same page on how to resolve the issue. Uh, and as a result of that, um, we see, we see uh, strained relations, uh, not being able to take a common view of the problem and of the solution. President Biden, uh, even though he has concluded his review of the North Korea policy, is yet to show his preference on how he would like to tackle this problem. Is it going to be through negotiations? What kind of negotiations? At what level? Uh, what would be the agenda of the negotiations? All these things are not very clear. And with President Biden caught, uh, you know, in a lot of other domestic and international issues that he's had to confront with, uh, his focus on North Korea has not really sharpened into anything concrete as of now. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I find North Korea going ahead with its nuclear capability buildup, and uh, many of its missile tests, uh, I think, are uh, sort of signals that it is willing, it is wanting an engagement on the nuclear issue, but uh, President Biden hasn't yet obliged. Denuclearization, giving up of nuclear weapons by North Korea is going to be a very difficult proposition. I don't think it's ever going to be possible unless it happens as part of a universal approach to giving up nuclear weapons. So this is something that we'll have to think about seriously as to how much uh, we would want to engage with North Korea with a view to freezing its capability, not so much as denuclearization. I think that is going to be very difficult. 
Now, the implications of the North Korean issue for India are not necessarily direct. We don't face a threat from its nuclear weapons uh, the way we do from Pakistan and China. But where we have a problem is of the possibility, the risk of illicit sales of nuclear material and technology from North Korea. Uh, it's a country which is, which is cash strapped, which is facing a lot of economic uh, problems. And it is a country which has been part of, uh, non -pro of proliferation uh, networks with Pakistan in the past, and we know about that connection. So the chances of terrorist organizations of Pakistan linking up with North Korea to get access to some kind of nuclear material to carry out acts of nuclear terrorism is something that I think is a cause for major concern for India. Uh, also, the acceptance of brinksmanship behavior. You know, earlier we used to think of countries like North Korea exercising nuclear brinksmanship, but this was not seen as mainstream behavior. But in today's times, when President Trump started talking the same language as Kim Jong-un on nuclear weapons, which button is bigger and, you know, those kinds of issues, we find brinksmanship behavior being accepted. And because Pakistan exercises the same behavior with India, uh, mainstreaming of such behavior becomes a problem. Uh, for India. And of course, amidst all this, we have China as the master puppeteer of the relationship uh, that the US would have with North Korea. On the one hand, it sort of takes a hands off approach and says it is something between US and North Korea to resolve. And at the same time, it keeps propping up North Korea as a nuclear adversary uh, in order to create complications for US security. So we find a rather complicated problem here uh, with North Korea and how it implicates on India. Briefly on Iran now, uh, I hope many of you are familiar with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, which is still in jeopardy. This is the what is loosely known as the Iran deal that was signed in 2015 in order to put limits on Iran's possibility of acquiring nuclear weapons. So there are two ways in which you can build nuclear weapons, either through uranium enrichment or through plutonium. Uh, and the idea of this uh, deal was that you would put a stop uh, to how Iran could do either uranium enrichment or plutonium production and reprocessing. But unfortunately, Trump withdrew from the GCPOA in 2018. And as a result of that, the current status is that Iran has also been undertaking steps at withdrawing from the JCPOA. For a long time, Iran hung on, hoping that the European Union will be able to bring uh, US back into the deal. But that did not happen. And then Iran started taking steps from withdrawing, uh, you know, uh, going back on the commitments that it had taken as part of the uh, JCPOA. So it has, increased, uh, it has increased its enriched uranium stockpile uh, the enrichment has gone up from 3.67% limit that had been set by the JCPOA. More and more centrifuges have been activated. Uh, no operational limits or on, on level or amount of uh, uranium that it will build up uh, is now in the picture. And besides that, what has happened from June 2021 is that after the Iran elections, the presidential elections, we have more hardline leaders in positions of power uh, and despite president biden coming to his uh, you know chair thinking that this would be the topmost priority uh, for his administration to resolve the issue of the jcpoa till today we haven't it's going to be the end of the year and we haven't been able to arrive at anything significant there is no breakthrough yet implications of this for india is that india is interested in iran for both economic as well as strategic reasons uh, but after the U.S. withdrew from the GCPOA, we had to reduce our engagement with Iran uh, because of our relationship with the U.S. So this had implications for our oil availability because we were taking nearly 11% of our oil imports from Iran uh, when we had to start reducing them. And we have had to do a tightrope walking between U.S. and Iran. Both these countries are important to us from the economic and the strategic point of view. Uh, but because the two are so wide apart in their relationship, we have to tread the path rather carefully to keep both sides happy. 
There could also be a domino effect if Iran went nuclear. So if Iran was to go nuclear, many other countries in the region uh, have expressed these at the thought. And countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Turkey, Egypt uh, have uh, uh, expressed intentions of moving towards nuclear weapons. I'm not saying it's going to be easy for them to do so. But the threat uh, of to their national security uh, will be over a period of time. The possibility of proliferation increase out of this development. For India, Iran matters also because of the huge diaspora. We have there and the remittances that we get from Iran. Let me now come to AUKUS, which is uh, on this front. Though the security part between Australia and US, uh, uh, if not, is not taken uh, as many kind. The official has something with you of them. They anyway close the relation. Uh, and AUKUS is another level of that. And what is AUKUS? It is essentially the security partnership that will allow US and UK to transfer to Australia eight nuclear powered submarines. They have made it very clear that these are going to be nuclear-powered submarines, or what we know as SSNs, and not SSBNs. They are not going to have nuclear-tipped missiles on them. It's just that the naval, that the nuclear propulsion uh, will be available on these platforms, which will make them uh, more stealthy, uh, have, have give them greater endurance, so they can stay submerged for a long period of time. They don't have to surface like some of the other submarines. In order to get their fuel. Uh, um, besides the SSN. Have also talked about and know how systems issues as well. Take a part of the asset is transferred to bit and, and this to nuclear weapons. So, human states and you think this is non nuclear. State. It is like what we had in India during 1980. It was on strong to India. We did them. We other such plan the 2000s also to them. And the point is that just in the using it for any purposes itself. But you were not, uh, you did not have access to technology or the material that was being used for the. Reactor. Now, Australia has said that it has no desire for nuclear weapons, not even for enrichment technology. So, to get the GPU, will get the highly during that the reactor, but the enriched uranium will come from outside. Uh, it will not be enriched in Australia. Uh, Another noteworthy thing here is that Australia does not have any nuclear experience. They have one research reactor which has been operating for several decades. But apart from that, they have not operated any nuclear power reactors, not had any other experience with nuclear material handling except for mining of uranium. Uh, that uran that uh, um, uh, material, that mineral that uh, Australia has large deposits of. Now, all of this is going to be transferred under IAEA safeguards, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which, uh, which safeguards and monitors the nuclear programs of all countries, is also going to be looking at the IAEA, uh, is also going to look at the Australian uh, uh, you know, availability of SSNs as and when that happens, which is put at about a decade from now. Now, how does this uh, matter to the NPT? The NPT does not prohibit SSNs. So countries that have or do not have nuclear weapons, non-nuclear weapon states also can have SSNs as far as the NPT is concerned. So the AUKUS is not in non-compliance with the NPT. 
it is in compliance with the NPT. However, the SSNs or the material that is being used in the SSNs should be under comprehensive safeguards with the IAEA. Now, in the past, SSNs have existed only with nuclear weapon states and IAEA has not applied comprehensive safeguards to nuclear weapon states because they are already known to have nuclear weapons. So monitoring, safeguarding, verifying material in SSNs has not been an issue that the IAEA has handled up till now. And therefore, uh, with secrecy around basing of military platforms like the SSN, uh, the IAEA is going to have to decide on how it will be able to safeguard the nuclear material that will become available to a non-nuclear weapon state once the SSNs come into the picture. So as I said, currently SSNs are only with nuclear weapon states, and this is going to be a major concern of the IAEA in the future. You know, the Director General of IAEA, Mr. Rossi, uh, has said that while the three countries have approached me uh, for, you know, uh, creating a safeguarding deal for the SSNs, uh, but we will have to put our heads now to find out how we are going to practically be able to do this because this is on a military platform in a non-nuclear weapon state uh, and on a platform which is largely which largely thrives uh, only when it remains in secrecy. So this is going to be a problem. Now, implications of the AUKUS for India, as I view them, I think we can see them from two perspectives. One is when I see it from the national security perspective. The AUKUS looks good because what it is trying to do is to build a counter for China. And China is a major security concern for India, uh, especially after, I would say, the Galwan Valley incident in 2020. China has always been seen as a long-term threat, but the political engagement uh, between leaders of the two countries, the kind of boundary agreements that we had come of for peace and tra tranquility at our uh, you know, uh, line of actual control, had kept the relationship in a certain kind of a uh, checked manner. But what we see now is that China is far more aggressive and expansionist in its behavior. So this China needs to be countered. And to that extent, AUKUS, if it is able to do so, is a good thing for India because it will distract China and it will complicate its security. The capability enhancement will happen of a quad member. And India, as a member of that quad, will be happy to see Australia's capacities being built up uh, even though there is not so much a, a military dimension of quad at this moment. But the potential of that military relationship is what is going to bother China. And to that extent, it's a good thing uh, for India. But if you see it from the perspective of regional and global non-proliferation, the kind of precedent uh, that the AUKUS sets could become problematic. You know, I spoke about security dilemmas how one step taken to enhance security can actually undercut security and become a dilemma for you. Uh, and I see AUKUS uh, becoming that kind of a problem. It is transferring technology of SSNs, which has not happened in the past because it was seen as something which could lead to proliferation. But with this happening between US, UK and Australia, and though the US has said it is a one of exception that is being made for an ally, the problem with this thinking is that other countries can also think about this exception for their allies. So there could be a turn in the nuclear cooperation relationship between China and Pakistan, where China is able to give SSNs to Pakistan. And Pakistan would certainly uh, you know, be very happy to receive SSNs for its training and operations exercise uh, before it can, in some time in the future, move on to the SSBN platform, the nuclear uh, uh, missile carrying platforms. Now, China has a desire for parity with the US as a rule setter. Uh, today's China does not believe that it is less than the US on any front. And if the US can be the, the, the country that is going to set the rules of the new international order, then China does not want to you know, fall behind in any way. Uh, but the problem is that the US has provided this kind of an uh, arrangement to an ally which is uh, uh, which which is compliant with the non-proliferation regime, which is a good member of the NPT, but the but the customers of China 
could possibly be countries which are either non npt members like north korea or uh, uh, pakistan or they could be uh, which are not compliant or uh, or not believed to be compliant with the npt in uh, every uh, single way like iran so this is where the problem comes with this precedent that has been set uh, so on the one hand india gains from what the orcus is doing but on the other hand we could end up being the loser if we have more ssns in our neighborhood uh, you know floating around uh, provided by china because it today has the capacity and the capability to be able to do so so this is how i would frame uh, the entire orcus debate uh, that you will be sort of getting into a series of lectures on this from the non proliferation dimension as seen by india so i will now stop here and i look forward to receiving any questions etc that you might have i can now stop sharing thank you so much ma'am for your insightful and in depth presentation on the nuclear proliferation and the orcus deal um you uh, you rightly point out uh, the offense and defense mechanism that is being you know gearing up between the world powers and also how the us is engaging uh, in building the hypersonic defense mechanism in response to that of the russia and china so uh, it also you also pointed out the you know the how the superpowers and uh, uh, is engaging in the arms race that would uh, in return create uh, you know a security dilemma for india and also the threats uh, the increasing threats that have been coming from china so uh, with this uh, orcus deal it is uh, rightly understood that the relations between the three allies and the china were already low and the deal that is orcus which did not name china but was widely understood to be in response of his expansionism is uh, in the south china sea and the aggression towards taiwan drew a swift, a swift response from beijing so thank you so much uh, ma'am we move on to the question answers session if you may allow me sure yeah ma'am so ma'am the first question uh, that uh, comes that the us and uk us uk and australia have announced a historic security pact in in, uh, in asian pacific in what is seen as an effort to counter china it will let australia build nuclear powered submarines for the first time using technology provided by the us however the three nations are already allied with each other in more ways than uh, than one so the us uk and nato allies and australia new zealand and the us are linked by the anzus pact all three are also members of the five i intelligence uh, alliance so this arrangement raises a question that is would the quadrilateral security dialogue quad be continued to be relevant okay so thank you for this first question and i'm uh, happy to see that people do have an interest in the region uh, so you very rightly you know uh, it's been pointed out that um, the relationship uh, between the three countries is already very very deep uh, on many dimensions they have uh, existing arrangements uh, including on intelligence like you mentioned the 5i program Uh, but the dimension that they have gone into now with the transfer of technology on nuclear submarines hasn't been done in the past so this is like breaching a new threshold of that cooperation uh, between the three countries now in the context of this the question essentially is would quad continue to be relative and i don't think this arrangement is in any way in conflict with quad you know the quad has a different purpose that it has been created in fact as i pointed out what is happening as a result of orcus is that orcus is adding to the strength of quad by providing a capability to one of the quad members so it is not that the two are in conflict with each other the idea of the quad came up and i have you know repeatedly said this that the uh, the actual shape that quad will take how much becomes the military content of quad will largely depend on china's behavior if you remember the idea of quad had also come up in the past in 2000 uh, you know beginning of 2000s uh, but then it had gone away because china's behavior was not seen to be aggressive or 
uh, you know, uh, so abrasive to the countries um, that were dealing with China at that moment. But then you found today's China from 2017 onwards become extremely, uh, uh, you know, strong in its approach to different countries, wanting to overwhelm those countries. And as a result of that, the Quad once again was revived uh, in some kind of an arrangement. So currently, if you see the Quad statements that have come out, the kind of meetings that have happened, the focus of Quad has remained on cooperation uh, in many dimensions, with the military dimension kept at a low level. But the potential of Quad in the military dimension is not lost on China. Uh, they do understand what this means. Uh, and this is going to uh, increase, the military capacity is going to increase with the coming in of uh, the SSNs with AUKUS. So AUKUS is a different kind of an arrangement, which is going to add to the capacity of the Quad. But it's not in conflict with Quad. It's not going to take away the relevance of Quad. The relevance of Quad will go away if China's behavior changes. Because if it does not look aggressive and abrasive to the countries which are members of Quad today, then the relevance of Quad goes away. So I would say it's up to China to decide on how uh, or what final shape the Quad really takes. But it's a good idea that the capacity building of the Quad members is going on uh, with deals like the office. Yes, rightly said, ma'am. Um... So there have been also skepticism about uh, AUKUS and there are many Indian scholars who have been cautioning about the damage of Quad and uh, its repercussions for India. So here comes my second question that given the momentous growth in the Indian-US strategic partnership, what do you think did the US didn't give the Indian submarines? And India never asked the US for uh, these submarines. As you know, India has been building its own capability of uh, uh, towards SSNs as well as SSBNs. And with, for the SSNs, we've had some help from the French. Uh, and the SSBNs uh, is an indigenous technology that India has invested in because we find having nuclear uh, weapon submarines uh, is going to be the uh, is going to be important when we are a no first use country. So for us, signaling survivability of our platform. And SSBNs are the most survivable platforms because they are out at sea and uh, very difficult to detect. And therefore, the signal uh, that goes to the adversary is, even if you use your nuclear weapons against me, my submarines will be able to cause retaliation to you. So you cannot get, get away with the first use of nuclear weapons. So because of that strategy, India has invested in its own technology on SSBNs. Uh, on SSNs, we do have, we have taken some help. It hasn't, uh, uh, but that program has run a little slow. Now, with the precedent that has been set uh, with AUKUS, uh, doors open for other countries also to take this kind of help. Uh, so while I'm not committing to anything about what India might do in the future, but possibilities have opened up for India as well uh, to look at it. But from the US, uh, no, we haven't approached them. So it's not that the Indo-US strategic partnership has taken a hit because of what they did to Australia and not to us. That's a relationship at a completely different level. Uh, and uh, we will have to do our own cost-benefit calculation to, to decide where we want to take that help from, what kind of SSNs and how many numbers that we want to build, and how much is our own strength at the indigenous level before we want to go outside for any help. Thank you. Uh, so ma'am, this AUKUS uh, uh, partnership, uh, in this AUKUS partnership, Australia will end its contract given to France in 2016 uh, to build 12 diesel electric powered submarine to replace the existing Colin submarine fleet. So this deal also marks for the first time that the US has shared nuclear uh, you know, propulsion technology with an ally apart from the UK. So back in 2016, France had uh, described the Australian contract as the deal for the century and the start of a 50-year marriage. Now that France is not a part of this deal, so the next question that comes is, given the fact that the deal has, you know, enraged France, ma'am, how do you think the, you know, will the deal impact on broader transatlantic strategic and collision building with European partners to balance with PRC, 
when we know that the deal has, of course, enraged France, presenting the main European actor in the region? That's a great question because uh, AUKUS has created fissures uh, in the transatlantic relationship. So uh, we've all seen the kind of anger that was expressed by France uh, when the deal was first announced by, you know, withdrawing its envoys from US and UK, uh, expressing its anger in public about how the deal had been struck between these. And it certainly feels that it's, uh, you know, contractual obligations uh, that Australia had taken with France have suffered. Now, there is the other part of the story where the Australians say that the contract had never really grown into anything much, that the negotiations had just dragged on for such a long period of time, and they did not see that capacity building happening uh, for them over a period of time. And they, I mean, there was frustration at that end. Of course, the diplomatic relationship could have been better handled. Uh, what we saw was a public falling out of the transatlantic relationship, which is why it has created this kind of... Uh, you know, fears amongst people. Also, what uh, if you if you said in the beginning about uh, how uh, you know France is so miffed, and that there could be a division in this relationship that could then uh, undermine the capability of these countries to counter China. So, at a time when they should be together to you know provide a united front against uh, the possibility of what China could be doing. Yeah either in the South China Sea theater with Taiwan or any other, you know, place, uh, they seem to be a divided house uh, because of this anger that has been expressed at office. But we have also seen President Biden uh, very quickly reaching out to President Macron and trying to uh, resolve the situation. Uh, these are mature democracies. And while there will be voices which are, you know, which come out of anger and frustration, uh, we will see that uh, they are able to uh, patch up quickly. Uh, what is uh, more important, I think, that we need to watch out for is that suddenly there seems to be a market for SSNs. You know, the French have been uh, in some kind of uh, negotiations with Brazil for a long time on building SSNs because Brazil and Argentina are two countries that have expressed a desire for having nuclear powered submarines. Uh, but the rest of the community, the international community, was not very much in favor of this and nobody was encouraging them uh, to develop the SSNs because this would have brought the same problem that now the IAEA will have to handle because this technology is coming to a nuclear weapon state. Brazil and Argentina would have been the same kinds of states. Uh, so France was not encouraged to take this relationship further. But in today's times, with France... Uh, having seen what US and UK have done with Australia, uh, with the French having the capacity to provide this technology to others. And the good thing about French nuclear technology will be that it is going to run on low enriched uranium, which has less chances of proliferation compared to highly enriched uranium, which will be the case with US and UK uh, nuclear powered submarines. Uh, so France will now have a possibility of engaging with more countries for uh, undertaking these kinds of uh, you know, arrangements further. So that is a concern, I think, that we should be look, looking out for. Uh, the transatlantic relationship will patch itself up because there is too much at stake for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the counter that they have to face uh, with China uh, will bring them together. Uh, so uh, the AUKUS has not only enraged France, but has outro also outraged China as China faces a very powerful new defense alliance uh, in the Indo-Pacific, um, not only from its real, you know, um, defense alliances, but also from its regional partners, such as Japan. So coming to the next question and the last question of this session, ma'am, uh, it comes from Bhavdeep. Uh, ma'am, he says, with regard to China, in terms of technology and the number of nuclear heads, it's rising by day, day by day. And with their revisionist tendencies and their aim to replace the U.S. as the number one superpower in the world, Beijing is a big concern. In lieu of this, there was a lot of talk to include China in the New START Treaty last year as its renewal came closer between U.S. and Russia. But China vehemently denied to be a part of it, stating that the number of warheads under its arsenals are quite low as compared to Washington and Moscow. Will it make sense to push Beijing to be a part of it at the later stage? 
Yes, it would make eminent sense to have uh, Beijing become a part of arms control at some stage. I don't know if they cannot be a part of the New START Treaty, uh, which is only a bilateral treaty between US and Russia, but more treaties like New START that can bring in China uh, certainly will make a lot of sense from the international security point of view. But as Babdeep has herself pointed out, China is not interested in arms control right now because they believe that our, uh, you know, that we have not built up our capability enough uh, to be able to counter the U.S. nuclear deterrence. And the manner in which U.S. is going ahead with its own capability build up uh, with a small arsenal that China has, they feel very threatened. So therefore, they have uh, started building up their capacity in terms of warhead numbers in terms of building better missiles which are able to penetrate the missile defense and going in for hypersonic missiles you know very recently you've all been reading about the kind of hypersonic missile test that uh, they conducted uh, so you see china on that trajectory right now uh, in my conversations with many of the chinese scholars uh, across track to events etc the sense is that the chinese leadership is not worried about the kind of nuclear risks that could be coming from its behavior. Uh, you know, that the numbers are rising, that they are uh, uh, what we call nuclear entanglement, where they are using their conventional and nuclear missiles uh, in the same kind of a mode. So they are lying at the same bases. The same command and control structures are in charge of nuclear missiles. China is doing this, believing that it is going to deter the U.S. better because the Americans can't take a chance by attacking them because you don't know whether you might hit a conventional or a nuclear missile. So that's that's the Chinese logic. But the problem is if the Americans were to take that step of attacking and they ended up hitting a nuclear missile, then retaliation is going to happen from China. So you will uh, uh, you know, stumble into a nuclear war without actually wanting to go there. So these are some of the risks which are not well understood by China or it's not willing to at least publicly express that it understands this, uh, the risk because it wants to, it, it believes that it is actually enhancing its deterrence by creating these risks. So that is where the problem lies and therefore it is not willing as of now to engage on any arms control. My own sense of the situation is that arms control will have to start with talking first. So you need to open negotiations to start dialogues which are not currently existing between US and China. And deals like AUKUS actually lead to more hardline positions because China is, as you said, outraged uh, by what uh, uh, AUKUS has meant. Uh, so this is where the problem lies as of now. You know, I started by saying countries are hedging against each other. This is exactly what AUKUS is uh, you know, going to contribute to that hedging uh, between these uh, countries. Uh, so it's a space which has to be watched very carefully. And I'm sure organizations like yourselves, young scholars like all of you, uh, will keep a watch on that and see it from India's perspective about how things are going to implicate for us and what we should watch out for and, and, and take care of. But thank you for this opportunity. I've really enjoyed the interaction. Great questions. Uh, and keep up the good work. Thank you, Ifra, and thank you, Suryoshi. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for enlightening us with your delightful uh, presentation and for, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, for encouraging us and also for, you know, uh, having uh, said the uh, having said uh, in depth about uh, the nuclear non proliferations and the nuclear proliferations and how, uh, you know, uh, negotiations and pacts could help build a peaceful world. Uh, thank you so much again, and I would now request Ms. Siyoshi Sinha to deliver a word of thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am, for agreeing to be, I mean, enlightening us. And we had been so eager to hear you, but uh, so sorry about the um, uh, time uh, problem today. We, are, we were also going live, so most of our uh, uh, invited guests for watching it live also so, so I, i'll share the link with you very, very soon and, and uh, as you have said and i have also mentioned in the book that i have done under your guidance that yeah the main problem is we need to solve the region problems by talking it out those are that's the first baby step towards nuclear absolute nuclear disarmament so, so correctly put, ma'am. So, 
here I am delivering the formal vote of thanks. Honorable Speaker, Dr. Manjit Sethi, respected ma'am, founder director, Avik uh, sir, our most valued invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to have uh, been asked to propose a vote of thanks for this occasion. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Red Lantern Analytica and the entire team, and uh, I extend a very hearty vote of thanks to uh, you, ma'am, for gracing your important work and sharing with us your findings and opinions today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to listen to your wise words, and I have always been encouraged uh, uh, by you. My being is all because of you, so there is no saying things. I mean, uh, nothing more to say about it. You all know it, ma'am. And uh, we are extremely grateful to you for uh, touching on the subject of non-proliferation and India's position through the excellent presentation that you have demonstrated. It created immense awareness among new learners and aspiring researchers in this field. It would be our immense pleasure to invite you over and over again to uh, spread awareness around the subject in the near future. Am I being audible? Yeah. Yes, Am I being are. audible? Yes, you are, Sriyoshi. Uh, Hello, am I being audible? Yes, Hiroshi, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, okay, I'm so sorry about the internet connection. All right, ma'am, so we're extremely grateful to you for touching on the subject of non-proliferation. Uh, we're extremely grateful to you touching on the subject of non-proliferation and India's through the presentation of Demona. It created immense among the new learners, hiring researchers in this field. It would be our immense pleasure to invite you over and over again awareness around the subject in the new near future thank you very very much once again ma'am and also ma'am <laughs> this is uh, just to tell you that kindly pardon us for any kind of errors that we might have committed during the event since this, uh, we are a budding organization we are trying our very best to create a space for ourselves in the security intelligentsia and we will definitely need your guidance at each and every step we take ahead thank you so much ma'am wish you good luck and good health in the future Thank you. Thank you very much, Roshi, and all the best to you and the organization. Thank you, ma'am. I'll, I'll get connected to you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank Goodbye. you so much. Goodbye. Can we end it, ma'am, with your kind permission? Sure. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>